Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome here to this week's recording, uh, week four, with our um, primary primary topic is project-based learning. And also here in this recording, I want to wrap up uh, an, an item from case-based learning and uh, complete that complete that component. Now, the um, this this next item is project-based learning. And it is um, perhaps a little different view from what you may consider to be project-based learning. Notice that we do have inquiry in it, uh, and it uh, we are we are looking at you know real-world issues, problems, challenges, and that may not necessarily be the case for uh, inquiry-based uh, uh, learning. In, in all of these cases, uh, it, it is significant that. Uh, students have the foundations uh, in, in the bloom steps as well, is that in project-based learning and inquiry-based learning uh, and these other formats, that students have that fundamental knowledge, they have the fundamental comprehension and the application of those fundamental ideas. That is very, very important. Uh, typically, uh, in this project-based learning, it is sometimes envisioned as uh, teacher-directed learning up until the project. So we have a, a standard classroom teacher leading the classroom teacher, giving lectures, and that's possible in these, uh, in these settings to have some teacher-led instruction. But it is important uh, here to note that all of these uh, different methodologies, uh, that we need knowledge, comprehension, and application. We need those basic knowledge, those basic ideas, but they're not necessarily being presented by a teacher. Uh, students are students are learning some of these things on their own. They're being assessed on them as you would typically assess students for knowledge, quizzes, standards, assessments. But then we're going to take them be beyond that. So in project-based learning, the idea, the, the fundamental idea is that we are not going to do this in a setting where the teacher, the instructor is leading this, but rather where the instructor is providing resources, is providing guidance, providing direction, providing assessments, so students have the fundamentals so they can then move on. And that is the case in, in all of these in all of these settings. Uh, what's significantly different here uh, is that a student has a concluding project, and that project um, is uh, is authentic. Uh, the presentations are authentic. And it's delivered delivered to a public audience. For example, these students here are, are doing what looks like a science project, uh, and so we would have science related. The individuals of the public audience would be science related. Uh, perhaps the whole class could be in, would be involved, but then you would have a panel of experts there to provide the, some students some insights and. Uh, some ideas back to them in, in the presentation. If you were having uh, students uh, speak about other countries, what they were like, perhaps uh, uh, you may have a, a travel agent come in who has been to those countries or someone who travels quite a bit and sit on a panel that uh, delivers these uh, their projects to those individuals. So what's significant here is that it is a public audience. It could be a panel of experts however you want to define that, but the final project is not necessarily delivered only to the classroom. It's delivered to a wider, uh, a wider setting. So in this uh, way of project-based learning, we are looking further beyond the classroom to bring in uh, those individuals who have expertise in the field uh, to give students then uh, some ideas and, and some insights. So in a traditional, uh, if, we, if we can do some compare and contrast here, um, of course in a traditional setting we would do a reading lecture, etc., cetera, uh, and then uh, students would respond back to that. Uh, however, in this case we're giving students a real problem to solve uh, compared to a, a lecture they're trying to save a nation from uh, economic crisis. In a science classroom, uh, we could have students complete a worksheet uh, about a, a topic. Whereas in a, in a project-based learning, we could have students creating a game, uh, perhaps uh, on, a, on another moon uh, or someplace else in the solar system. Um, in um, social studies, uh, 
instead instead of having students write a research paper on the Great Depression, they could perhaps build an, an exhibit or a diorama uh, that ha has experiences of various groups uh, in the 1930s. This is an interesting contrast of the of the view of American life uh, in in the 19 in the 1930s. These eight essential components of project-based learning are demonstrated here in this in this um, in this graphic, um, and uh, we are focusing in on in-depth inquiry, having questions that they look at, very much like inquiry-based learning. It's an authentic problem, um, and we are accenting some very, very significant pieces. Um, is it looking at significant content? Are we looking at something that's really, really important? Can we develop, use this project to develop uh, collaboration, communication? Uh, and some of the technical things in 21st century skills related to that communication. Can we help students come out with some skills and applying those skills um, in, um, in their presentations or in, in their project? We are looking at students to, to get in depth with their inquiry. So it's sort of a step beyond inquiry-based or a step different from inquiry-based uh, in, in the sense that we are looking at a product that they're going to produce. And we have a driving question that they are looking at. Um, is there a need to know? Establish a, a need to know with these students and why um, it is important. And having the students uh, have a voice and a choice in the project that they're doing, the direction that they're taking, based upon the driving question, based upon the fundamental knowledge that they're bringing into uh, this topic from where else they've where else they've learned in the particular unit, uh, the facts, the information they've been assessed on it, they understand that they have good comprehension, they can apply it, and now we're taking it beyond that um, into into this project. Do they have opportunities to sit back and reflect and perhaps revise their focus? This this voice and choice, perhaps as they get further into um, their inquiry, they might find that they would be taking off in a separate direction. And, of course, this idea of the public audience, having someone outside the classroom, someone outside the school, uh, perhaps uh, in the sense of outside the school, meaning students and perhaps the teachers, unless some teachers have some really interesting uh, pursuits, uh, hobby pursuits, uh, perhaps parents. Uh, are, are experts in the field that you're talking about, where students can come in and and give their uh, give their um, presentations and show their products to them. So uh, it's this public audience. It's just not the student body and necessarily the teachers, but beyond, but uh, beyond that. So these are these eight significant elements in in project-based learning that we want you to be looking at uh, should you want to be taking your uh, should you want to be taking your um, uh, final project in this course toward project based learning your final your final assignment toward project based learning be certain that it has these eight uh, these eight components that are uh, part of this notion of project based learning uh, i want to sum up here uh, something from the case that you are looking at and looking at some of the draft materials and some of the early uh, submissions uh, as, as I see them, um, I, I want to point out something that I specifically have uh, somewhat stayed away from in that case. Uh, and, and that is, uh, there, there is some interesting work uh, out there. Um, this work is over 10 years old. But this is the start of this work by um, a researcher named Margaret Roblier. Her name is spelled R-O-B-L-Y-E-R. This uh, article was first published um, in the ISTE um, scientific, uh, their, their journal uh, of uh, technology in schools. Margaret Roblier and John Marshall studied a, an, an online school. And what they attempted to do was to correlate 
correlate the student's success as measured by their final grade in the course with some, some uh, internal um, self-view characteristics uh, and, and there, there, those, um, those uh, student characteristics with what it took to be successful. And they started out with a rather long survey at that point, uh, many, many questions in it. Uh, around 70 questions has now been reduced to about 25 questions in the current, in the current version of their survey, but they found that there are uh, four significant four significant components to be successful in a fully online setting. First of all, student has to be a good student. Student has to be a good student to be successful in an online setting. So, uh, and they have to ha and they have to have positive self-esteem beliefs uh, about themselves. They have to be able to take risks is the second point, meaning that uh, should something, should a, perhaps a link in a course not work or something not be working at the moment that they just don't shut down and forget about it, but uh, they're willing to do some um, uh, capabilities of themselves of um, self-assessing the situation, of moving on if necessary, uh, and uh, it sometimes when they don't know the way that they just jump in there and, and work anyway. The third point is that students, to be successful in an online course, must have access to technology. And they must have some basic skills in an online setting. And uh, finally, the student must be able to self-regulate. They must be able to put down the remote, put down their phone, put down uh, whatever they're doing that occupies their time and, and work. So in these online schools, some of you are reporting some interesting results because of the populations that they serve, uh, whether it is credit recovery or whether it is supplemental courses. And um, here is an idea that I have worked, uh, worked with uh, from Margaret Robliers and looking at other, um, looking at programs, reading some of the same reports that all of you have been reading. And here is my suggestion for students in an online setting, fully online, or it's a supplemental program where a student goes to, um, they, they take traditional uh, courses at school, and then they go uh, perhaps uh, one period during their day to the library, and they do their work. Uh, and that is, in order for students to be successful, my recommendation here is that excellent this only occur with the students who are A and B students, well, the excellent students. Uh, this goes to this idea of achievement. Uh, the average students, I think we can put them into hybrid settings. Uh, the literature is calling it blended. It's, I think it's best described as hybrid, as you've seen in, in the other videos, meaning they're partly in class, they're partly out of class. Our, some of our Concordia sections are hybrid. They meet three times during an eight-week. That's a hybrid setting. This is what um, Staker and Horn call a blended setting, uh, meaning it's the best of both, so to speak. You get you get face to face, and you get online. The C students, uh, high school students, would be um, very very supported in in that setting. Uh, the excellent students can self-regulate, they can motivate, they can take responsibility, um, and they can survive or they can do quite well in online settings. Those struggling students, those credit recovery students, those students need lots and lots and lots of um, TLC. They, they, need, they need teacher support. They need adult support. Putting credit recovery students in online settings is nothing but disaster. Those, typic, those typical students, uh, those students put in those settings have typically low uh, completion rates, low success rates, meaning 50, 60 percent of those students have then failed this course a second time. Um, and so it, it is important to give those students lots of face-to-face, -face, lots of assistance 
in the work that they are doing as opposed to they weren't successful in the regular classroom. Let's now put them online. And that is just setting them up for disaster itself. And so those struggling students in credit recovery, the worst place to put them is in an online setting. Based upon the research and what that research is showing us, as well as what these reports are showing to all of you as you work up, as you work through your case as you work through your case study. Now I have some questions for you uh, for your optional participation that I'm putting into the course wiki, uh, and uh, you can participate those in, in the sense of project-based learning, uh, and also to a question in regards to these uh, ideas. Uh, based upon the research and based upon the reports that we're seeing about who can be successful in online settings where the course content and assessment, all of that is delivered online as opposed to a traditional classroom uh, or an online uh, or a hybrid classroom where some of that can occur in a hybrid setting. So for high school students, these students who can successfully work there, ABs put them in there, the average students in a hybrid setting, and largely the credit recovery students in a face-to-face -face setting with some digital uh, content for them, but where they are getting lots and lots of attention and assistance from, from adults.